So hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Spotlight Podcast, the unofficial podcast for Century 21 sales representatives in Canada, where we discuss the hot topics and important news in the real estate industry. I'm your host, Linus Killies, and with me, as always, is Aaron Richardson. Hi. Aaron is a broker and general manager with Century 21 Heritage Group. Aaron has an extensive background in online marketing, technology, and customer service. And I'm the head of business development at the real estate marketing company, Homania. So we've got a great show today. Uh, we've got a few things we're going to be talking about. The main segment today is going to be about the CREA's Commission Danger Report. We'll be getting to that shortly. Uh, but first, I wanted to talk about how my real estate courses are going. There was a surprising amount of interest in my real estate courses, uh, and people wanted to see how I thought, like my impressions on the courses and how they're going. So uh, basically, the first thing that I kind of came across when I was going through was I was actually fairly impressed. When I signed up for my real estate courses, I was really expecting them to be really dry, just very textbooky. Um, but the way the online versions at least are set up is it's very interactive. There's a lot of kind of like clicking here and there. It might seem kind of gimmicky, but to be honest, it, it keeps you awake for <laughs> lack of a better term. It keeps you interested and engaged. And it helps with that kind of visual side of learning too. It's something that you might get from a, like an in-classroom experience. Um, the one thing that I did notice though, is that I think it would be fairly difficult if you were jumping into these courses, uh, if you didn't have any kind of cursory background in the real estate industry, they, they kind of glaze over a lot of, uh, topics, which most people would probably assume are common knowledge in the real estate industry. Uh, but I think it would be, it'd be tough if you're just getting to this for the first time, just kind of, kind of getting your bearings with like, you know, the, the glossary of terms and everything like that. But other than that, I was fairly impressed. Um, the one thing that actually me and Aaron were talking about off camera last time was the fact that in the real estate welcome package, they included this, the, well, actually more than just one little flyer, but many flyers on this whole pass it uh, online study guide system. Now, I, th I think me and Aaron had some differing opinions on it. Now, they really are pushing it hard. Now, the pass it's a third party company that provides like online study guides, sample tests, that kind of thing to help you pass the courses. Now, Aaron, you, you had some pretty strong feelings about this. You want to you want to talk about that? Well, quick? I did. Yeah, but a little bit more, I guess, about it. Uh, you know, I just believe that when you're taking an educational course and you're trying to increase the professionalism in the industry, um, we shouldn't be trying to get people to pass. We should be trying to get, educate them to know how to um, deal with the situations. And it's you know, I've the, the feedback I got from the agents that have taken the courses where there were many people that would show up for the first day, let's say if it was an in-class, close the book, go home, study, pass it, not open the book, and then be able to, you know, complete the exam. And it's kind of reminds me of Cole's Notes versions of things. So if I'm taking a course in history back in, back in college or, or university or even, you know, back in high school, you know, um, could you imagine the professor says, listen, here's my history course, stay if you'd like, but if you don't want to, here's how to pass it. You know, and, and I just, I don't like that mentality, I guess, you know, let's study for the exam rather than learn the content. Now, I'm not saying that's what pass, pass it is. It does help. It has some good exercises. I don't know if you've done any of them. Um, I was talking to a, a, um, a course instructor yesterday and she says, well, you can't really knock it. It does help people through the courses. And I get that. I understand that. Um, I guess my second issue I have with it is if it's a third party source, why is Aria pushing a third party profit center. Yeah, for sure. And that's obviously a concern. Like I've got absolutely no problem with study guides, but yeah. the fact that they're, they're pushing it so much, it makes you wonder, like you said, what, what their kind of like intentions are. I, I know that, um, Aria, the, the Ontario, uh, body that uh, puts on these courses, a lot of the revenue comes in through education. So perhaps one of the reasons they're really pushing, trying to get like new signups and, and pushing this education side of things and, and worrying more about like getting people signed up as opposed to like uh, actually getting people to uh, have a higher quality of, of knowledge coming out of these courses is because maybe they're, they're looking for just to increase the revenue stream. So well, I can, I can see that differently being a motivation, but it really has to, it really has to be focused on, I mean, we pay dues to Aurea in order to provide um, education and provide, uh, you know, lobbying governments and all that sort of stuff. The things that we we want to increase the professionalism in the industry. So Aurea, Ontario Real Estate Association helps do, uh, helps do that. Um, do that. But um, I know, in the, you know, some questions have come up in the past as uh, how well are we educating? And then I was talking to, I guess, the instructor yesterday, and I understand that they're going to be heading in a direction which is a little more interactive um, with the instructors as well. So, but the problem still is, I mean, I, I know, 
I know they have certain policies. You know, there's no mandatory attendance. I, there was mandatory attendance for for my courses. I know I had to attend 80 percent or 75 or 80 percent of the the classroom in order to to be qualified. But I when I took the broker course, which was only a few years back, um, uh, we had the, the it changed. I mean, you didn't have to show up for the classes. You can just study the guide and pass the course. And to me, I think that that's you know, just hurting the the professionalism of the industry. Yeah, for sure. And that is mentioned in the danger part. I'm not sure if we're actually gonna be touching on that subject, mm-hmm. but it's just the the public perception of of realtors and their just general competence level. Like there's obviously a lot of great realtors out there, but there are also some very poor ones too. And you think that if you have, you know, a very solid foundation in these online courses, just 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 jumping into becoming yeah. a real estate agent and you know, having a great training system as well in place once you get out and you are re- a registered real estate agent. Um, you think that would kind of help uh, get around those problems. I guess we should just move on then to the danger report itself. So for the danger report, it's publicly accessible. It was commissioned by Korea. Uh, it was recently um, announced, I guess, or, or shown off at the AGM meeting uh, for Korea in March. You can get access to this by going to dangerreport.com slash Canada. There are American versions of this as well. So make sure you go to dangerreport.com slash Canada so you get the Canadian specific one. And you just put your email address in, you, you click OK, and it'll send you the, the full PDF. It's 72 pages. It's not as long as it sounds to, but it's, uh, it's fairly, uh, fairly condensed down. But what we're going to do is we're going to go over specific sections of the danger report that we thought were interesting. Now, just so you know, this danger report was commissioned by Korea, and it's just the opinions of professionals in the industry, like industry leaders and such. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that these these topics we're talking about are like imminent threats to the industry. It's just people's opinions on what could potentially be issues down the road. So, that, so keeping that in mind, this report was sectioned into four sections, uh, issues that could potentially affect salespeople brokerages, boards and associations, as well as the MLS system. So we're going to go through, we're just going to pick like a topic or two, I guess, in each section, starting with salespeople. So one of the sections was talking about in there, and that particularly got my interest, was that the for sale by owner evolving into more of a do-it-yourself model, being a bit of an, uh, a problem moving forward, especially, you know, as a real estate agent too, you want to make sure you stay relevant. And as you get uh, better and better tools for a for sale by owner situation, you you know, as a real estate person, that makes you probably a little bit nervous that you might, you know, start lo- losing relevancy in the marketplace. So, Aaron, yeah. uh, I, when, it, when it comes to sale, for sale by owners, I mean, we've always had them. There's always been for sale by owners. I mean, things that are changing as technology is changing, information is changing. And so we as, uh, whether it be boards, associations, realtors, uh, we have to evolve and change with it. Um, and understand that we're going to always be relevant as real estate agents, and that that's not going to change. Um, but we do have to evolve with the changes and make sure that we're, you know, still having a competitive edge. And and that's with the knowledge and professionalism, and um, making sure that uh, we are properly educated and we are out there with a value proposition. So, but I can see where it's a danger because I think everybody, even back in the '70s, '80s, '90s, doesn't matter. Real estate agents comp- uh, competitors were always with each other or with the individual homeowner who uh, uh, wanted to skip paying the commission and uh, try and sell it themselves. And there's some c- concerns that people have with that. And there'll always be people that want to try and sell it themselves too, right? Yeah, I was actually really surprised by the numbers they gave in the danger report too, saying that you know typically it's about 10% of transactions are for sale by owner. I thought that was pretty high, I, just from my experience seeing in the, in the marketplace. And especially in Quebec too, it says that it can be between 15 to 20%. That, right. seemed, that seemed pretty high to me, but... Um, um, well, I mean, you do. I mean, you, listen. When any any time, and, and when it gets the competition issues and all this sort of stuff that we've um, dealt with in the marketplace with fair competition and everything, ten uh, percent is actually a fairly low number. Like ninety percent of people do um, use a real estate agent, so that's pretty um, that's pretty strong in terms of you know ninety percent of people agree that a professional within the industry can do a better job selling my house and get a better price and also protect my interests. So I think that's a pretty yeah, strong well, number too. But for, for sure. Like the for sale by owner thing, like it's nothing that I would ever consider personally because I mean, I think most people would say, you know, hiring a professional, not only could they, you know, potentially get me a lot more for my house, which would cover, you know, the, the commission costs of the agent, but also sell the home faster and know what they're doing and, and help you from like a liability standpoint too. You don't want to get into kind of any hot water with the sale as well. Right. So uh, from my standpoint, it's kind of like hiring an accountant for your business. It just makes sense because, you know, they might be expensive, but at the end of the day, they're probably going to save you more money 
than doing it all yourself too. Um, I, I actually was thinking about uh, even a better example this morning that, because uh, um, we, we talk about doctors, lawyers and all the rest, but um, accountants. Uh, what about agents for um, uh, professional sports? You know, professional sports agents. Does the uh, professional, you know, baseball or hockey player or basketball player, do they negotiate their own deals? Do they put together their own contracts? And they're talking millions and millions of dollars. And houses now, especially in Toronto, are millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, do you want to put that in the hands of uh, people that aren't um, there to, you know, or that aren't professionals and, and don't have the education? And so, um, you know, I think it's very similar to that type of industry. And they'll always be. There'll always be people that will try and do it themselves. Yeah. And always. I mean, it, it t the Danger Report talks about this too, is kind of commoditizing real estate and such too, in that like it, it, it people that tend not to be able to see the big picture, they just look at the, 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 the dollar value, right? And be like, oh, I can just do this myself. It'll cost me like a few hundred dollars instead of paying an agent many thousands of dollars. But what they don't realize is, is all the kind of other things that go into it as well. Like you said, the negotiation. Like, you, you know, people might think they're a great negotiator, negotiator and might be able to assess the value of their home, but they might just get taken advantage of in a horrible way. And this, these are very large transactions. Like you mentioned before, maybe maybe it's not like, you know, the, the size of a professional real estate, I sorry, professional sports contract, but it is most likely the largest financial transaction a person's going to be making in their lifetime, right? So at least well, that usually, point. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the contracts, yes, you're dealing, dealing with many different years and stuff like that, but the average... I mean, average hockey player getting into the, I think, uh, into the industry is 800,000 just to start, right? So, you know, and that's where houses are and millions of dollars. Yeah, you are talking about bigger money, but listen, um, the, the reality is, is um, when, you're, when you're looking to sell the biggest investment of your life and you're looking to put that type of money on the line, you want it done professionally and 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 you and listen the money in the pocket is what they really care about and it's not so much the money that you have to spend to get the money anybody because more money in your pocket rather than trying to save a dime here is obviously important well i'll tell you a little bit of story about the last time i sold my previous home too um I was expecting, again, I'm in Kingston, so if you're in an urban center, these, these property values are going to seem a lot lower. Um, it, was, it was my first home. Uh, we were, I was expecting to get around the $250,000 mark for it, and we ended up getting around three hundred and fifty. dollars I was absolutely floored by how much money we got for it. And the real estate agent's like, no, you can get a lot more than you expect out of this. You should expect a lot more out of the marketplace and such. And like I, if, if I put it on the market myself, I would have undervalued it by, you know, almost $100,000 too. So it, it's just a kind of case where you want to make sure that you, you hire someone who's aware of the marketplace too. And I think that's just an important factor as well. Again. Well, and, and this is, and this is where people's, um, this is where information is changing and, and people are more informed now. There's more information available to them in terms of, you know, pricing and, uh, and strategies and, and online you can get, you know, there's a self-help book for everything and including selling your house yourself. So, um, with information being so readily available, um, this is where people are concerned that, you know, why not try and save some money or agents are concerned that people are going to be trying to sell their house themselves. And, and you're going to have some of that. My, with the danger report comes with, um, well, how do we combat that as agents? How do we, what do we do in order to provide a better value so that, uh, they, they can see the value in us. So, and that's where, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into some of the other things that, that, um, are a bit of a danger, but listen, you know, when it comes to education as well as value proposition and what you can do f to sell the houses and what technology you're using and, um, what systems are in place and the service you give, I mean, the value is there. Um, we, we get all our quality service evaluations back from our agents um, at the brokerage here and 99% of them are excellent, 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 excellent. So the agents are out there doing a good job of it. And I think that's the reason why we have 90% of the, uh, the, you know, that business in terms of, you know, being able to um, convince people that there is good value in using a real estate agent. Yeah. I guess you're always going to give those people that are going to want to sell on their own and try and save a buck kind of thing too. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a lot of what this danger report is, especially about the salesperson section is is the marginalization of the salesperson and making sure that you can combat that as well. Um, and that kind of goes into the second topic we're going to look at as well as just the decline, the relevancy of the salesperson as well. So well, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like you mentioned with, with all, you know, access to new technology and information, it, it almost makes it seem like doing it yourself is a lot easier or, you know, you don't need a salesperson to represent you. So China well, I can tell you, there's a big, there's a big gap right now in the difference between across Canada, 
So if you're in Alberta, opposed to if you're in Toronto or in Vancouver, um, you're dealing with different things. And I'm, I'm going to guess to say that Alberta's uh, market in terms of what, uh, what's happening there with the market with 19 listings on one street, opposed to here where there's one up and one down every day because of the you know, amount of sales and what's happening uh, in our marketplace, it's different. So people in, our, in our, our area are saying, well, why do I need a real estate agent when my house sells in one day? Like they're not doing a heck of a lot for me. I mean, I can go into all the different reasons what we do, but I'm going to do that because I think most of the people watching us here understand and they're in the industry and understand the need for real estate agents. However, I just think that uh, people do have to be aware that when the market turns and, and goes into a market where there's 19 listings on the street, it makes a big difference whether or not you have something working for you and doing everything they can to get it uh, it's sold as well. So I'm sure they're dealing with that uh, in Alberta. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's just such a different animal over there right now yeah. too. Uh, but that the market can turn uh, pretty quickly too. And it's always good, I guess, to be prepared for those kind of situations and just be able to respond to it as well. Yeah. So I guess uh, moving on to the next section, we can look at the brokerage side of things as well. Um, kind of an interesting topic that I came across here uh, in the Danger Report was that technology can become a runaway train is what they titled it. And that is about how, with again, talking about all this access to technology, as a brokerage, um, salespeople as, as well as the public are demanding more and more technological services, which can be pricey and be a drain on the financial ticket for the brokerages. So having to spend more and more money on uh, these services as a brokerage can can be problematic, especially if you know the 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 return isn't immediate or, or seem to be there. So well, I, what I see is, 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 is not so much that there were, you know, the money is money aside. It's the mistakes that they're um, afraid to make because technology, like you say, it's a runaway train. What that means is it's going every different direction. They don't know what technology is relevant. Um, the tre- technology that is relevant, you know, is it, is it worth buying into, you know, is it worth spending a lot of money? Are you going to get the return on the investment? Is this technology going to be outdated? A year from now, I'm going to spend millions today and then tomorrow it's not going to be worth. I mean, there's just so many different things to take into consideration. And let's be honest, there's not, um, in terms of the average age of owners of brokerages and average age of the real estate agent in the industry, um, I mean, it's 57, I believe, in terms of average age. So, you know, technology is is, is frightening to some of the people that, listen, I, I'm, I feel I'm technology driven and, and and I feel like I'm in the technology business, but even I get behind every two months when I don't read up on the newest thing that's happening. It's just, I mean, it's scary. Well, it's accelerating so fast in that, like, as you mentioned before, and they talk about in the danger report too, is that it's led to a bit of a, a generation gap too, especially with the, the older agents that are, are, are more conservative or just kind of more set in their ways to just adapting to the marketplace can be a lot more difficult, right? So um, I've seen owners that say, listen, I don't mind spending a million dollars tomorrow on something that works. But prove to me it works before I go spend it because I'm scared. You know, how do, how do I know this is really going to oh, you know, sure. change my front end system, back end system, uh, lead generation system? Uh, where are leads coming from nowadays? What are, you know, what's a good website? I don't know. You know, that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, and you have to iterate and move forward with your systems and technology. But again, you don't want to move in the wrong direction or spend money needlessly. Is what That's that right. Yeah. At. So yeah, you always have to be careful. And it's it's tough to make that change. And you see it in the industry all the time. You get these these very large companies um, that are, are set in their ways. And they're like, okay, you know what? We know this business model works going forward. They don't want to have to like shake it up and change it, you know, yep. even though something else might be coming. Maybe a good example of that is uh, like the cable companies, for instance, like you got the kind of like a rise from something like Netflix. At first, you know, they might have kind of scoffed and be like, okay, whatever. Like we've got a great business model yeah. here. Uh, we've got this, you know, this large revenue from consumers paying for cable on a monthly basis. But now that they're starting to get a little bit more concerned about cable cutters because more people are, are ditching their cable bill because they're saying, okay, well, I don't need to spend a hundred dollars a month. Having something like a Netflix come in and, and uh, kind of shake up the industry a little bit to the point where, you know, at first you, you, they don't really realize what kind of uh, situation they're getting into and how the industry might have to adapt. And uh, it's important, I guess, as an industry to make sure that you can adapt as these new technologies and everything come up. But again, you don't want to jump at the first thing because you don't want to destroy your business model or or needlessly spend money where you don't have to. It was actually kind of interesting you bringing up Netflix. I always thought that the biggest failure with any brand in the last you going to say Blackberry? 
<laughs> no, well, <laughs> no, listen, BlackBerry is, I mean, it hasn't completely, at yeah. least they haven't. As a handset, obsolete. as a handset manufacturer, they, yeah. I remember when the iPhone came out, they're like, oh, we, we've got a solid hold on business. The iPhone's never going to overtake us and this and that. And then you've quickly seen them have a Black huge Bear's fall a good from example. grace. So but when uh, you brought up uh, Netflix, I was thinking um, Blockbuster video. Oh, yes. Yes. I like remember. what a great brand, Blockbuster. Yeah. Why could Blockbuster gone online? Yeah, I used to go to Blockbuster every week, and and yeah, well, I think Blockbuster did try and go online, at least in the states, but it just was a little a little too little too late, I guess, was their problem. So, um, yeah, but they've completely disappeared, and they were such a dominant the company just what was this like yeah. you know six seven years ago maybe right i would uh, love to buy that brand and rebrand it and then go back like um, look at show me right show me is doing well with rogers of course they have a little bit of uh, help with the rogers brand behind it but they're trying to go against uh, the netflix's and all the rest of it but why and yeah, blockbuster's got such a great brand but anyway off topic go ahead yeah oh no that and that's yeah. well it, it's off topic but it is just uh, something that businesses and industries in general need to be aware of if they yeah. want to see relevant and another example too if you look at it, what uber's been doing to the 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 taxi and cab sure. industry recently as well right um and and actually uber specifically mentioned in the in this in this danger report as well uh further down the road because you know once you get access to these these this new technologies that can really shake up the system you got to be careful about those because those can disrupt everything too right so no 100 percent yeah. yeah. Uber's, oh, I always thought Uber was funny too because they always have all these lawsuits and strikes and everything, you know, like the cab strikes. And I'm, they're probably just sitting in the back there loving it all, this free publicity. I don't think I would have heard of Uber if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, there's cab drivers striking in almost every city, it seems, and, and they're settling lawsuits left, right, and center about, you know, this, that, and the other. Thing. It, it's, it's, an, it's interesting. It is a good, um, it's a, it's a good thing to look at and to see how um, industries deal with these sort of things. But you're right. Uh, the publicity that uh, the cab drivers were giving Uber was like, beautiful for them right i mean and and they could have just sat back and go okay well how do we now as cab as as an association of cab drivers of toronto for example or any other city how can we get together and provide the same sort of type of service or or maybe a, just a, a take off of the type of service they're providing and just look at how they can adapt you know, yeah i didn't see anything like that and that's the problem people are, are resistant to change and they're there i think the the first response is to defend your own situation yes. and setup as yes. opposed to adapting to like a new player in the marketplace or a new technology and that's, that's right that's the thing i guess as a as a brokerage as, as a manager as a salesperson uh seeing these new technologies be like oh well the way i do it's better that might not necessarily be the best approach to going forward with 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 new technology maybe you should like look at it investigate it. maybe see if it's especially if it's becoming popular trying to embrace it yourself as well yeah well and I, i've got to put a you know, like, uh, kudos, I guess, to Century 21 corporate in terms of uh, we, we ha what we have is a power of the brand. We look to our brand and, and uh, Century 21 Canada to provide us with some direction when it comes to technology. And I was super impressed with uh, the moves they've made to bring Jack Miller in um, from actually the same company that did this danger report for Korea. So we've got a, a nice little um, I guess connection with very smart people in the industry when it comes to technology and what we need to do to go forward. And I've seen some great, uh, uh, great ideas coming forth from Century 21 Canada, and I, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be putting that to, to place very soon. Yeah, I was also very impressed too that they responded to um, to just seeing that they they need to move forward as well, going mm -hmm. um, from a technology standpoint, and to audit their current systems, see where they are lacking, and see where they could move forward in the future as well. So, it, and it's important, I think, to to bring in a third party. Uh, from time to time, just to just to kind of you know double check to make sure that you're doing an okay job, especially if your salespeople are mentioning too, you know, say Absolutely. like, well, I think we're I think we're we had a great edge before, but we're starting to fall a bit behind, and, and like listening to that feedback from agents is always important. And it's, Absolutely, it's they did that. So yeah. All right, so I guess we can. That, those are the big problems with the the, the brokerages that were outlined in the danger report. Well, I yeah. guess there was one other two that I wanted to quickly bring up as well is the fact that. We've seen this trend, and I know this has been trending for the past few decades now, so maybe it's no surprise, but you're seeing those smaller, like, I guess, mom and pop brokerages uh, getting gobbled up by the larger ones going out of business in favor of just larger and larger brokerages. Um, it seems to be harder to compete from from their standpoint. Uh, I mean, you, you probably have a lot more experience with that. You work with a fairly large brokerage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine just a lot of it is kind of economies of scale, right? Like once you're a larger brokerage, you can provide more services to your agents because you've got more agents uh, to, to kind of pull from in terms of a revenue source. Whereas if you're a small brokerage, you know, if you've got 10, 20, 30, 
30 sales representatives, you might have a problem offering services that large brokerages can. I mean, you can't compete on the recruitment side for well, training. Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, when I got into the industry, this was mentioned and I still think is relevant today is that um, unless you're a really, really big brokerage um, or you're a small 10 to 15 agent, you know, micro sort of sub brokerage or brokerage, uh, those those brokers tend to be OK because, you know, they don't get in over their heads and, and they provide their their 10 agents, 15 agents with some good support. But, um, yeah, I, I do find that uh, if you're in the middle, if you've got the 50 to 100 brokers, you're not making the money that you can compete with the uh, the larger ones. And that's always been a bit of an issue, um, you know, um, but it all goes down to, um, you know, like I said, with Jack coming on or doing, you know, anything from a technology standpoint, it costs money. It costs a lot of money to have those back end systems that work and CRM systems and websites and, you know, everything that we, you know, put forward with uh, education and, and and everything with the Century 21 brand. So the issue I think what's happening is even the big brokers are feeling the pinch um, is the reduction of the commissions to the brokerage. Um, everybody's sort of with them when it comes to competition. They're lowering and lowering their fees and providing less and less services, and then they're finding that it's hard to stay in business or provide the services because they're they're getting less fees uh, to be competitive in the marketplace. Um, so what you're seeing is uh, larger teams, and I think this was in the danger report too. Teams um, uh, saying, well, instead of opening a brokerage, let's just start a mega team of 40 agents within the brokerage. We'll piggyback on all liability with the broker of record, all uh, education. They'll, te they'll teach and train us, uh, technology, the brand, like everything. And we'll just pay a small fee because of the fees being so small and competitive to the brokerage to do that all for us. We cannot build a business any cheaper than that. And so these teams are, are doing that. And um, I know a lot of big teams in our area are still, still with their brokerages. And you wonder, why aren't they breaking off? Well, the, it's just it doesn't make sense from a business standpoint. Yeah, and yeah, the, the commission splits. It's amazing how they've how they've trended in the favor of the salespeople recently in recent years as well. Too, uh, I know, uh, you know, twenty years ago you, you'd see like 50, 50, 60, 40s who were more commonplace, but now I'm assuming those are pretty unheard of. <laughs> so, well, actually, it's it's interesting you say that. Um, I do believe there is a business model. I've seen it um, because of the technology. Now, here's here's the crazy thing. People have an issue giving their brokerage, let's say, an 80-20 split. They want a 90-10 split, right? They, you know, I want as little, as much money in my pocket and less going to the brokerage. So I understand that. But if I join that team over there and they give me some leads, I'll do a 50-50 split. So now you got these micro brokerages within a brokerage on a team taking 50-50 splits, which it used to be back in the day, and we're starting this micro brokerage. And I've even seen some brokerages come up and say, listen, I will give you your leads. I'll give you 100 leads a month through online technology and you'll be on a 50-50 split. And people are going, yeah, I want to join that brokerage because I'm giving give business. Well, especially if you're a new agent just kind of coming into the business too, you don't yeah. have that you know, very sphere of influence to back on. Onto. So is it, is it possible that technology is going and people are afraid, to, you know, with the commission split, everything and all this technology, is it possibility that technology can now make brokerages again more profitable as long as they join on the 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 bandwagon of lead generation through technology and providing services again back to the back to the agents well that's a big red herring right if you can get, if you can get the volume of leads that you can supply to your salespeople and show them the value in you know being a member of your brokerage and sure i guess you, you can potentially see these commissions trend back upwards but the one advantage of having uh, those like mega teams like you're talking about is typically the leader of the team's got such a you know an established name or you know yep. a lot invested in these technologies that do generate leads for them that they can farm out a lot of the business to their I don't know what you call them I guess the kind of like new recruit type agents or, or the members of the team so there's well, a bit more of a unique situation I just but I am also finding it's not just about the leads I'm I'm finding very very like good well run teams value proposition isn't about leads I'm going to give you. It's about the training, the support, the coaching, the one-on-one, -on -one, all the stuff that the brokerages used to do, including advertising for them and providing them leads. Now they're saying, that's great. I want to go back to that model, but it's difficult now to get, you know, we're going in one direction, lesser, lesser uh, commissions and lesser, less, less service. And how do we turn that around? And I think this is one way to do it is to go back to the basics and say, listen, let's provide more services, charge a little more, but 
let's let's make sure that the agents are getting the support they need to to and that creates a better professionalism and all these danger reports go away <laughs> yeah well i guess one of the problems too is if you're already established brokerage you can't just go back and be like well we're gonna start giving you more services but everyone's you know commission splits are going in the other direction like once you it's give tough. someone yeah once you have someone negotiate at 90 10 you can't exactly claw them back to an 80 20 without a, a very big justification for doing that right so well, why not create some teams within the brokerage and say listen i'm going to pair you with uh this you know this person's going to be the team leader and create these teams for the support. It'd be interesting to see which way it goes, but there's a lot of different models that are emerging because of the differences in, in, in what's happening in the marketplace. But uh, there are different, yeah, different models out there. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, anytime I've gone into any of the smaller brokerages too, I, one thing I can definitely say is the, the, the it's more of like a family environment almost, right? Like you get a lot more, like everyone's really tightly knit in those situations yeah. as well. So I can see the, the drive for that. And like you mentioned, if you're in a small brokerage, you're going to get a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with the other agents and, and the management at, at the office. So yeah. again, that coaching is a little bit easier, I guess. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll move on to the next section, section C, boards and associations. Um, one big thing, and from my standpoint, as a technology provider that that deals with data feeds from boards all the time, um, that I guess is kind of near and dear to my heart, is the the fact that there's a lot of opposition to consolidation of boards. Um, our company, uh, Homania, who does a spotlight program, we have to interface with dozens of boards across, you know, across Canada. I think there's something like 90 boards across Canada these days. Every one of them or most of them have different systems in place, different formats of data that comes down to you and, and different policies and procedures, which seems a little, really redundant in a lot of cases. From my standpoint, and I know this, is the this would be a different opinion if you're a real estate agent, especially in a smaller market. Um, but it would just make so much more sense if there was a larger board or just maybe a few larger boards that kind of serviced larger areas um, and, and uh, there was more consolidation. And you think that from a, a financial standpoint as well, you know, if you, if you don't require all these small boards around anymore because we are becoming a bit more um, with all the technology and everything being a bit more like national, uh, you know, you've got realtor.ca and everything now too, right? Um, you, maybe you're, you're removing the need for these smaller special interest boards that are, that are specifically designed to tailor to, you know, smaller marketplaces and such. So it just, to me, I, I as a consumer and as a technology provider, I feel like it would make a lot more sense to have boards merge amalgamate. Maybe you can get rid of even the three tier structure. I know I guess it's probably pretty drastic with the, the boards and the provincial level associations and the national level associations, but it just, seems like there's a lot of redundancy and overlap. And I guess that's that's kind of the issue that they're bringing up here is that mm -hmm. because the way the industry is going, there is becoming a lot more redundancy. And actually, just recently, I know that um, a lot of the boards in southwestern Ontario, like the Hamilton board, Oakville, Oakville Milton, and a few others in that area there, they just recently merged their MLS system together. And maybe this, that's what's just happening. You're just going to see more... Um, Kind of partnerships with between boards as they move to like to partner together from a technology standpoint and i know even in the toronto area too there's like the brampton real estate board uh you know they, they piggyback on toronto's uh, on the treb system uh so maybe you'll see more of that as going forward even though they still can maintain their yeah their representation they're small you'll boards. always get opposition when, when yeah. somebody has uh you know wants to amalgamate anything and take, oh, yeah, you know, for take sure. the other. But we're talking about people's these, jobs too, right? Like yeah. all the administrative staff and such, if you're merging well, that, boards and, together. And, and let's say area related issues, mm -hmm. right? So boards that, uh, you know, so you have one board looking after the whole thing. Well, you have to subdivide that into the smaller boards or smaller, let's say what we call a micro board maybe or something. Yeah. But uh, you, you do have to look after the interests of the areas that they 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 work in because if selling a house up in uh, Collingwood is going to be you know different than selling a, a condo down in Toronto in terms of the, you know, the assignments that happen in Toronto or the septic systems that back up up in, in you know, in the cottage country. But, you know, so you've got different issues and I'm sure they can work through that. But uh, you're right, you know, from your standpoint, you know, it, it could it could make some sense for sure. Um, from an agent standpoint, we, we you know, kind of want to feel part of a smaller family usually. You know? Oh, for sure. And, and as I mentioned, like, I, I see the draw for that. And that's just from my perspective, not being a real estate agent. Well, I guess not being a real estate agent yet. I'm yep. still doing my courses. Uh, but um, yeah, exactly. But I, I think the public perception uh, as well could be something that might, might endanger but the power, as well. The power of a large board, which I'm a part of, obviously, I think we're the second largest board in uh, North America, uh, which is TREB and the Toronto Real Estate Board. But um, be having that power of technology and systems and, and new innovations and 
and things that they can uh, provide us with. Um, if we need to fill some gaps in the education side of things, if we need to, you know, massage diff different things here and there in order to create the professionalism in the industry, a, a bigger board is better. It, it's like you knew what the next topic was. It's almost like the perfect segue into the next <laughs> section, um, which happens to be just because you do have these these big mega boards, like you, most provinces do have one, as mentioned <clears throat> as mentioned in the danger report. The, the the fact that you've got a big board, especially like in Ontario, you've got TREB, um, that can almost like muscle out the the other boards in the area, or or even just from a provincial standpoint, start taking on more responsibility and, and kind of edging out the provincial level um, uh, hey, listen, associations. If, if you provide more services, you've got a better value proposition. People are going to use you, and that's where you know you say muscle out. But no, I mean it's providing the services, providing the education, providing the technology, and uh, the smaller boards unfortunately just can't afford to do that. And that's it. Just comes down to affordability, really, more than anything. And it's, you know, obviously how the boards run and everything too. Um, you get into a lot of politics when we're talking about associations and boards, though. So. Oh, yeah. for sure. And none of this stuff moves extremely quickly, so nothing's going to be changing overnight. That's no, sure. no. But uh, that is, you know, that was one of the things on the on the danger report, for sure. Yeah. So looking at the MLS system as well, uh, that's another thing they talked about in the, the danger report too, is, and again, as a technology provider, this is something that uh, interests me in particular is having a national MLS system. Um, Obviously, uh, like Realtor.ca, I guess, has kind of, you know, m moving towards that a little bit and having a, a publicly accessible uh, set of real estate data across the country. But obviously, it's not as closely protected as, as local MLS systems. Well, so so the, the big word that people are using nowadays, and we'll, we'll throw it in there, is portal. So a national portal would be the Realtor.ca is a sort of a portal for the MLS system, right? Yeah. Well, what what really gets me too is, and we deal with a lot of agents across a lot of different boards. Is um, just just for an example, um, there's some brokers we deal with in say the Oakville region, which is just west of Toronto. Um, they post their listings to the Oakville board. They also post their listings to the Toronto Real Estate Board. They also post their listings to the Hamilton Board, uh, which is you know just just west of Oakville. So right. it just seems extraordinarily redundant to have to do that. Sure. And if there was some sort of just, I, and, and again, this it all boils down to, again, that you've got different areas having diff different needs and, and uh, different kind of requirements for their listings and policies and, and such. Well, that, let's just all important. get along and, and a handshake a little bit better, right? And I think, mm -hmm. I think from a realtor's perspective, uh, would be a lot easier. Are we really talking about boards here? Or are we talking about just technology? Just like we use the Strata system. Why can't we have a national, um, not board, or, but just actually, said a, you said the data, MLS system, right? Yeah, you, you said the connect. Yeah, exactly. The, the yeah, a national national uh, resource for looking up listing information which, for for agents sure. specifically. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess the idea behind it all is just trying to make it a little bit more fluid for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. The national MLS system, and yeah. it's something so, that I don't think has been proposed or anything is going to happen anytime soon. Just like any of these other situations in in the danger report too. But it's just something that they brought up um, as a potential issue for the MLS system going forward. So. Yeah. One of the things of the danger report, we can go back. I know we're jumping, well, I'll be, be jumping around a little bit, but uh, I did want to discuss uh, commissions. I think was one of the things, um, the downward force of commissions within the industry. Um, and, I, you know, I can't speak for all of Canada, um, but that's, you know, it's been a topic for, I'm sure, 30 years, 40 years, for how, however long we've been selling real estate is, you know, what are we, you know, being paid? And, you know, the consumer doesn't want to have to pay as much and prices are high. So, you know, we're getting more commission and all that sort of stuff was was one of the issues and the concerns, especially with the for sale by owners and everything. So, yeah, well, from what I've seen going across different uh, brokerages, because uh, you know, commission is always a hot topic, especially when we're trying to pitch a marketing package that can potentially you know increase your commissions. Yeah, uh, it does seem that in uh, any place where you've got higher land values, obviously the the transaction that just the transactions are higher dollar about numbers, uh, yeah. you tend to get more competition for commission. Whereas, you know, if you're getting the lower lower home values, uh, people tend to get closer to a full commission or quote unquote full commission for their listings just because, you know, if you want to make a, a living as a real estate agent in a, in a small market, I guess, where, you know, land values are low, you need to justify, you know, this, the, the, the paycheck. Yeah. So, so I think I think that's more what the, the issue is here is saying like, well, you know, 
especially in your urban centers like Vancouver and Toronto, the, the price is going up, you know, 10, 20 percent a year, it seems almost every year. Uh, can you can you justify as an agent having your commissions going up at the same rate as well for, you know, arguably the same amount of work businesses on a per, per transaction basis? Right. Yeah. So um, I think that's what it's it's kind of getting at. Um, what, what I'd be concerned at would be if, if a certain percentage starts becoming the norm, if there's ever a downturn. Um, right or a slowdown in volume as well, because suddenly, you know, instead of selling, you know, 10 homes a year or something, you might be selling five or two or three or something. And, and that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're working on lower commissions, that suddenly, you know, reduces your salary at the end of the day by, you know, quite drastically. So, yeah, people- I just, I listen, I just believe that, you know, value for service, obviously, you know, and, uh, and I'm not going to give the same speech you probably, everybody's listened to a thousand times in terms of you just got to sell your value to get to justify that you're worth more than, you know, the next person or whatnot. But listen, just look at the market, see where it's going, where is it heading? If you, you listen, if you don't have to be the least and you don't have to be the most, but if you're the best value, and that's sort of how I do it on my listing presentations. And I think a lot of people respect that. They respect the fact that, listen, I don't, I'm not looking to save all the money. I'm not looking to, for you not to work hard and, and, and earn a living. We just want to be fair. And uh, I think that if you t- take that approach with people, uh, I think nine out of 10 people will see that you're, um, you're worth what you're, you're talking about because it's fair. And it's not the most or the least, but it's, you know, the best value. And that, that's what we pitch with the spotlight program all the time is it's just the value proposition. Instead of just, you know, coming in and saying like, I'll sell your home or whatever. You gotta say, you gotta say why you're going to get, you know, more money or sell their home for faster, make it a better experience be more professional and everything. And if, if you can show that you're worth the extra money in terms of a higher commission, then I'm sure they'll, they'll be willing to give it to you because, you know, this is the largest transaction of their life. Most likely to. Well, I talked to an agent the other day and she was a 5% agent. That's what she charges. 5% always has. You know, and she's been in the business for 30 years. But for some reason, her, her commission's way down and, you know, all the rest of it. And I said, well, have you ever considered looking, re-looking at things and just, you know, maybe you're not, you don't have to be as stringent on the 5%. I'm not saying you go to 3% or even 4%, but why not just, you know, look at the situation. And if, if you're going to lose the listing over half a percent and you can justify yourself at four and a half, you know, don't always be so rigid and maybe re- look at your value proposition. Are you still doing the same value proposition that you did in the past? You know, maybe you need to upgrade uh, what you're you're speaking about and technology and all the rest of it. And um, you know, so you know, it's not all. It's it's the same thing when it came down to what we we're talking about technology. You have to you have to move with the industry, and you have to uh, know where you can and where you can you know change your business in order to reflect what's happening out there, and, and so that you can uh, you know justify. You know, maybe the demographically, the areas have changed. You know, maybe that neighborhood that you're getting the 5% before isn't the same area it was before. So maybe you demographically have to change your areas and stuff. Anyway, yeah. just roll with the punches, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I think being fluid is very important. Yeah. And like you said, like being being stubborn doesn't help anyone, like no. Blockbuster or BlackBerry, for instance. Yeah, well, that's so, it. Right? So right. just evaluating, uh, you know, the competition in the marketplace and seeing what they're doing. And, you know, if, if uh, their commissions are, are, are dropping too and you notice your, your, uh, the number of uh, agreements you're getting is going down because of it. I mean, you might have to adjust your strategy, either drop your commissions to get those sales or, or increase your services and your, your value proposition, I guess. So the last five years, the average sale, I mean, it just doubled, right? Yeah. And, and if it's you're nuts. still charging 5%, you're doubling your income mm-hmm. in the last five years. So, and now I'm not, I'm not pushing it downwards and I'm not telling anybody to push their commissions down and all the rest of it. Just, just reevaluate and look at what you're giving for your service. Maybe you give twice as much. Maybe you keep it at 5%, but all of a sudden you've got uh, five other things that you're doing with. You're doing drone photography. You're doing all this different, um, you know, internet exposure and pay-per-click advertising. And and maybe you're putting it in two other different publications in the paper in order to justify bringing more people to the property. And and you're looking at it from that standpoint. Maybe don't change it from five. Just offer more services. Yeah, and that's the problem is if you're sitting there being you know stuck on a specific commission level and you know the the person coming into the listing presentation after you is offering so much more and in, in, at, at a lower commission level than you know as a homeowner it, kind of, it almost makes sense unless you, they really connect with you as a person mm-hmm. that you know just be like well this person's giving me like you know, all these different things for lower value like or lower price or lower cost like why wouldn't i go with them so i guess just making sure you yeah like you said you roll with the punches and, and just kind of make sure you adapt is, is always very important 
The one thing I can say is don't worry about what everybody else is doing. I mean, you should, I shouldn't say that. You should know what everybody else is doing, but don't complain about everybody else and then not look at yourself and say, hey, what can I do differently and whatnot. Um, With this industry, what we've talked about, all this danger report, we would have the same danger. Some of the things in the same danger report back in in 30 years ago would be still showing up today. So fizz for sale by owners and and, um, commission, push for commission to go down, even technology to that standpoint was always in you know the the you know danger of you know being able to adapt and everything so you know i just you know i don't you know i don't agree with hearing from a lot of different agents that the sky is falling <laughs> the sky is not falling i don't think we've ever had a more competitive exciting um industry where we're 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 still you know i just say making money listen we got into the business we need to make money and pay pay the bills and we're still making money we're still in the industry and providing services and customers are still happy with us so just continue doing it well right yeah and, and like we mentioned off the top these aren't imminent threats there's things to to keep in mind uh, going forward things that, that potentially may crop up or become larger issues in the future and there's one final one we're going to bring up as well is just the entry into the marketplace by a powerful portal. You've seen this happen in the States. You've got oh, your big one. Zillows and Trulias. And I, I've heard this, you know, this, the whole sky is falling thing for maybe the past 10 years or so with, with you know, th- what's happened in the States coming up and affecting Canada as well. Canada's maintained a pretty good uh, control over, you know, their, their major uh portal for the public with Realtor.ca still being the biggest one by far, whereas in the States, uh, it, it is third-party companies that have taken over control. I think a lot of that is access to data, um, but I'm sure, Aaron, you probably know a lot more about this than I would. Gosh, this is the biggest hot hot topic uh, in the last five years in real estate, So, and it's a difficult one because uh, we have to be careful uh, within an industry, and, and I, I plead the agents out there to be careful with regards to competition amongst the industry and why things, you know, if it is changing, is, is okay to change and adapt and still be competitive. Um, the issue that I think everybody, you know, and what we're talking about now is the big uh, Trulia and Zillows and everything we hear about uh, what's happened in the U.S. Uh, we're scared because, you know, it's going to come here. You know, everything in the U.S., it happens in Canada just a little bit further down the road. So um, should we be nervous? Should we be scared? We should be aware and we should be um, looking to different systems that we can put in place that uh, that we're still holding ourselves as competitive. Our concern is, of course, that uh, um, that we're going to be having to adapt and 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 now join on with some of those companies to get our listings out there. And and uh, I don't think you know it's just it's just evolved in the states. It's not in the U.S. It's not it's not taking the market down or anything like that. But these companies are making billions, like they're worth billions of dollars. So what we have in Canada is the um, we have a, a great system with the realtor.ca that people go to to search homes. We just want to keep make sure that we're giving the consumer what they're looking for. Yeah, and that stays relevant. I know realtor.ca recently kind of did a little bit of a refresh, but they definitely are lacking in a lot of places that they could be doing better. And I guess like they, there always is that imminent threat that there might be some a big player that comes in, especially you know depending on how things with the competition bureau end up shaking out too with access to the data. I'm not sure if that uh, is that's pro- what I'm assuming is probably the largest stumbling block for for these companies coming in is the access to the data. But if they did have that access, uh, you know, providing a better user experience and a better place to look up listings and get the information about listings for the public, like that's yeah. that's where you get more people flooding to those sites as yeah. opposed to Realtor.ca. I mean, the big, there's a lot of little issues and stuff like that with the Competition Bureau in terms of um, uh, what sort of information should we be putting out onto public portals. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the biggest one is the sold price. I mean, we talk about it. Um, should we be able to um, or should we have to uh, put the sold data uh, out on to, uh, up in the open market? And I, equivocally, I, I mean, we've done surveys from third party organizations that's done surveys of consumers that say, no, no, I don't want everybody and everybody to know what I'm selling my house for or what I sold it for um, or what I've purchased it for. So I think from a consumer standpoint, they don't want their information out there. But at the same time, they could say that, well, the consumers are out there and saying, I want to sell my house myself and I want to know what the house sold for down the road. Or um, you know, all the sold data in, a, in an area. So th- th- those are the arguments and everything. So it'd be interesting to see which way it goes. I do believe that privacy is important, first of all. And uh, I think that that's the standpoint uh, of the industry is saying, listen, we, we, uh, we as realtors, um, 
when somebody comes into our office, we have sold data for them, but we, we vet them. We make sure that we're giving that information to the people that um, are looking for a market analysis for the right reasons. We're not just giving up our filing cabinet and saying, yeah, go, go through all our files and see all the seller's names, see all the different floor plans and surveys and sold data and all the, you know, just help yourself. And we don't want to say help yourself because, you know, it's just not protecting the consumer you know, in, in terms of privacy data. So I'm sure they'll come to a happy, happy medium, I, I hope. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, we, we get uh, requests all the time, you know, if, if an agent keeps uh, a listing online after it's been sold, the, mm-hmm. the, the purchaser will, you know, complain and say they want all that, that information taken down right away. And we're, we're seeing that increase in frequency as well. I know a lot of more brokerages are starting to make, their, make it their policy to, to try and avoid uh, just allowing that, I think that put onto the, their schedules when they, uh, when they create their purchase of sale. Uh, to allow for the advertising afterwards just because it leads to so many headaches and complaints afterwards. Yeah, and maybe I'll just put, just give a little pointer there. We've we've definitely we've talked to organizations and, and we've talked to lawyers and all the rest of it. The best way to do that, like so what's the best way to get a permission from both the buyer and the seller for me to advertise and say I sold this house? Now, first of all, I don't think you should ever say you sold it for a certain amount until the house closes anyway. And even after the close, you know, as long as both sides agree, okay, fine. But just don't ask for the permission within the agreement of purchase and sale. Because we as a brokerage or any other third party to the agreement does not have the um, legal standpoint to do that. It's an agreement between the buyer and the seller. So to insert us to say, give us the ability to do that is not the right place. So, um, and this has been tested and in, in, uh, in court and all the rest of it, and it doesn't. But people, for whatever reason, brokerages are still putting in a Schedule B or whatnot. You know, will you give us please adver- You know, please give us adver- advertisement rights to you know advertise the property after it's sold and all the rest of it. So um, do that if you're going to do that in a, in a separate agreement. So it's a it's a side agreement to the agreement of purchase and sale um, that's between the buyer, the seller, and the brokerages. So just a little bit of a pointer there. Yeah, for sure. And and from from my standpoint too, I feel like if if the purchaser ends up complaining about it, even if if you know the the agreements were set in place properly and everything, that maybe it's just best to respect their privacy as well and take that. One hundred percent. So. Oh yeah. Uh, and it just solves a lot of headaches. So the, yeah. the number of uh, the agents have been like, well, I, I had it in my schedule B that that uh, they had permission to advertise. I want to keep it online, even though they're complaining. I'm like. <laughs> You know, if I was you, I just I just take it down. I'm not, I don't want to give you advice or anything, but it just seems like it's more of a headache than it's worth just to keep you know a website online. Hey, listen, you want to make sure the consumers are not. Yeah, you know, listen, we there are friends. Yeah, <laughs> there are clients, there are customers, there are everything. So listen, you know, respect the consumer, and uh, and I think that this everything about this competition. Um, this whole competition case and everything it's you know that's that's what we're we want to make sure we're respecting the uh the rights of the consumer so for sure and it's just a nice thing to do as a human being too i guess yeah. so okay so i guess i'll wrap up our danger report uh we took a lot of twists and turns in that discussion uh so we'll get into our tool app of the week i can't want to say tool of the week but app of the week uh, so Aaron's got an app that he wanted to showcase called Open Home Pro, and it's specifically for open houses and managing your leads that come into open houses. So Aaron, you want to talk about it? Yeah, so Open Home Pro, I've been using uh, this app or, or have used it um, even, I don't know if it's five years ago, four years ago. It's been out there for quite a, a, um, a long time. Uh, I think I got it in its infancy, infancy but uh, um, uh, it's done a, they've done a lot of updates and um, extra features and and whatnot. And what did the, what the app does? And it, there's a there's a free trial on on the app uh, as well, so you can go in and, and get it for free, and then uh, decide whether or not you're going to pay to upgrade it and go to the, I guess, pro version or whatnot. But uh, what you do is you set it up at your open house um, on your tablet, and as people come in, it's it's your sign in sheet. Okay, and you can basically ask any of the questions you want to ask. You can modify it to ask different questions. You know, I like to keep it about five, four or five questions. You don't want to go crazy. Um, you know, are you working with another real estate agent? Um, how did you see the house? You know, all the rest of it, your information that they want to provide. Um, 
now when you put the information in uh, of, about the person it goes into a, a database and it sends out a nice little thank you for coming to my open house and um, it keeps you uh, also in uh, in tune with the people that weren't working with anybody and uh, I'm sending you a list so that you can um, give them a call afterwards and it's really a sort of contact, a little contact database for open houses and um, what it does is it really it shows to the consumer uh, that you're technology savvy instead of writing pen to paper, you're ty typing in your stuff. So uh, I think the consumers like that uh, aspect as well. Um, it integrates with social media. So as um, soon as um, if you do have an open house um, and you're putting in the information about the open house, you take a picture of the house and everything, it'll uh, let everybody know on Twitter and Facebook and everybody that you're having the open house today. So it's an all-in-one sort of little mini CRM system for open houses. And it uh, it worked really well for me when I was selling. So you find that it actually helps you, can, I guess, get more leads out of it too, especially if the, the person signing up doesn't have representation. You find it's more successful than you know the old pen and paper method, I guess. Yeah, everybody solution. holds host uh, open houses differently. You know, I've tried uh, getting the information at the beginning, at the end, at different times. So, um, but all in all, what it really does is it, it uh, gives the advantage to, let's say, the younger real estate agent that's getting into the industry. It shows that you're technology savvy, and that's what people want. And uh, to the agents that have been around in the industry for quite some time or let's say a higher age de demographic that what it does it shows that you're still relevant and, and you are technology savvy so I think it's more of a perception more than anything else you can always take a, a list of pen to paper home and put it in your CRM system and everything but you know it does a few other little things and it may really I like I like the perception that it gives to the, the consumer for sure and, and perception and presentation is always so important right yeah All right. so I guess uh, we can probably just wrap up our show there we've been going for quite a while here um, so if you like the show, subscribe to our show on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts online. And please don't forget to leave us a five-star review on any of those sites. It really helps. You can watch this and past shows at spotlight.century21.ca slash podcast. If you need to reach us, you can email us anytime at podcast at homania.com. That's podcast at H-O-M as in Mary, E-A-N as in Nancy, I-A dot com. So this podcast was brought to you by the Spotlight Marketing Program, an exclusive marketing package available only to Century 21 agents in Canada. Spotlight provides agents with a comprehensive internet marketing strategy for their listings. We provide high quality HDR photography, stunning HD video tours, a cutting edge responsive website, and an extensive advertising system that will help you sell your listings faster, sell them for more money, impress your clients, and generate leads. So find out why so many agents are, are using Spotlight by visiting spotlight.century21.ca today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.